back to the channel. For today's video, I will be assembling the engine. Okay, so I turned the engine over on its face. So the face of the engine is sitting down to the table, and I have the crank placed in its position. So there is the Babbitt bearings on the inside of the three bearings. We have the main crank bearings are numbered one, two, three, like this. So the first two are narrower, and the last one slightly wider because this one also supports the weight of the transmission. So it has to be a little bit bigger than the other two. So the bearings themselves have some life left in them. They're not bad yet. When you do have to get them fixed, though, that means that the bearings will have to be melted out of the block and re-poured. So that's a bit more spendy process than it would be on a modern engine. But they have some life in them yet, so I'm not going to do that right now. So I put the crank back in here, and here is the one problem. The crank moves back and forth. If I pull on it a little bit, you can hear it clicking. So I measured that that's about 20 thousandths end play back and forth. The maximum is supposed to be four. So 20 thousandths is obviously a lot more than four thousandths of an inch. So this crank has way too much end play. Now in practice that doesn't affect too much of the performance, it's not a catastrophic failure, but it will make your magneto not work because this moves your transmission in and out that much and that will drastically affect your uh, magnet clearance on your magneto because right here you will have your field coils mounted solid to the block and then your magnets are mounted to the transmission flywheel that moves with this crank. So the mag magnets are supposed to be separated from the field coils by between 30 and 40 thousandths of an inch, it's supposed to be about 35. If this is moving back and forth, 20 thousandths, that's going to pull it way out of tolerance or, and it's not going to work. Your magneto is going to die. So I want it to work and I want to make this right, so we've got to fix it. So here is the uh, third main cap. So all three of the bearings have a cap that fits on top of them. And this cap moves back and forth too. In fact, it moves back and forth a little bit more than the block almost. So they should be about the same. But there's, there's a lot of play in it. And the cap is what provides most of the thrust bearing surface. So it's not supposed to ride on the thrust bearings on the block itself. It's really supposed to just ride on the cap. So the, the inside is a journal bearing, that supports the main weight of the transmission, but then the thrust on each side is what supports the movement back and forth. Now in practice there's not much uh, stress on the thrust surfaces because really the only thing that would provide uh, stress on those is the transmission when it's in neutral. When it's in neutral you have the spring depressed, so that is going to put more force on it to wear on those bearings. So generally speaking, they don't get as much wear, but there's no shims to take out. These bearings, when you wear them down, you can take out shims and make them work again. The thrust surfaces, you can't. So in practice, it's, they're, they're not supposed to get bad or terribly bad before the main bearing goes, but these bearings have some life in them yet. So I'm gonna try and fix this thrust surface. So what you can do to fix this, and it's, it's kind of an old farmer's fix, but it works and I'm hoping it's gonna be able to get me by but you can melt more Babbitt onto this thrust surface and then file it down real carefully and get a pretty smooth flat surface that will work and take up some of that movement. So I'm going to just try and take up the movement as much as I can and get it to as close to 4 thousandths play as I can. Um, but if it doesn't come quite to 4, um, I'll be okay with that. But I'm going to try and get it at least significantly better than it is now so the magneto will work and when the rest of the bearings go and it's time for a full bearing rebuild then we can fix it right but for now this should work so what i'm going to do is i'm going to melt babbitt and try and bond it to the babbitt that is on this cap and the tricky thing about this is you can't melt the inside of the journal bearing because this is more babbitt material on the inside here so you've got to be able to melt this top and add material to it without melting the bottom or adding material to the journal itself so it's pretty tricky. I'm gonna try and have a go at it. So here's the third main bearing that I have partially fixed. So I added Babbitt material to the thrust surfaces on each side, but this is not the original third main that came with this engine. The first one I tried, I accidentally messed up 
because I held the heat a little too long and had a little too much Babbitt on the outside here and the Babbitt rolled over onto the inside of the bearing race and there's a big blob of material there and then when I tried to remove it it ripped the inner bearing race here and was pretty bad. So I got a new used third main bearing from Antique Auto Ranch and this time it worked out a little bit better. I got a better surface on each side for my added material. I did mess up in a little bit of the same way, not as bad as the first time, but I did mess up the inside a little bit right here, but I was able to add material and scrape it a little bit and I think I'll be able to fix it. So because this is not the, the original bearing that came with this engine, it is not going to be fitted to the crank, so we're going to have to do that. So the inside of the bearing material needs to be fitted to the surface of the crank, because the crank surface is going to have a little bit of ridges and divots in it, and that's not going to match with this bearing from a different engine. Also, because I messed up and I had to add material here, this material is not that the right... Um, a surface is this. There's a little bit of a bump right here where there's new material. So this is going to have to be worn down to fit with the rest of the bearing. So the way we're going to fix this is using Time Saver Compound. So Time Saver is a lapping compound that was originally um, invented in, I think it was 1919, specifically for the use of Babbitt bearings to speed up the process. So I'm using the yellow label 100 grit very fine uh, Time Saver Compound. So this is a lapping compound and it will not embed into the material or continue cutting and that's very important with Babbitt because Babbitt is a very soft metal. This is the yellow label soft metal lapping compound. So that's very important when using a lapping compound with a soft metal like Babbitt. So what I'm going to do is take a little bit of that which is powder, mix it with some engine oil to a light paste. So that's what we have here and I'm going to put a little bit of that on the bearings on each side, the, the main bearing cap right here, and put this in the engine block with the rest of the, the crank and the other bearings installed, and just gonna tighten it down finger tight. Just finger tight, turn it, and I might have to get a turning bar. It's probably gonna be a little bit stiff, and I'm gonna need to get a bar and drill some holes in it and bolt it to the flange here, because I probably won't be able to turn it with just this. But bolt it down, just finger tight for a while, then as it, uh, whereas down the high spots you can tighten the bolts a little bit every couple turns and that will continue tightening down the bearing and wearing it down until it's all flush and smooth and you get the bearing tightened down to the proper torque specs. Then you can take it apart and inspect it and make sure that it's all smooth and you'll see uh, bright spots where there is a high spot in the bearing. You can tell that it won't be worn evenly. So I'm going to do that and this should be able to make this bearing fit with this engine. Now the other bearings, I, did, I don't think I'm going to have to do this because I didn't mess with them at all. They're original stock with the engine the way it was when I took it apart. So we just got to put the shims back in the way they were and we'll be good. Now we're ready to start assembling this engine. So I have set the crank in its bearings here. And first I oiled the bearings in the block, put a little bit, a couple drops of oil on them, set the crank in here turn smoothly now this side is where the timing gears are so you have the camshaft time gear and the crank time gear so these have to be in the right mesh for your engine to be in time now most engines will have a small dot on both of these gears and you just have to line up the dots when you mesh the gears together so that the dots line up and then you're good to go the model t has a dot on the cam gear Let's see if i can find it it's on the outside right there there's a little dot right there. I, th I think you can see it. And so that's the dot on the time gear. And now there is another marking on the camshaft gear, but it's not a dot. And this confused me at first until I, I had help to figure this out. There's a couple different dots on here, and those don't have anything to do with the timing. Someone punched dots on there, but they're not to do with the timing. What you line up with that dot is actually a tiny Ford logo on this gear. And I think that is really cool. There's a tiny little logo. I don't think the camera is going to be able to pick it up. Right here at the base of this tooth, it's always roughly in line with the key on the gear. So the key is right here. So you can see it just barely, a logo right there on the bottom of that tooth. And I don't think the camera is going to be able to pick it up. But it's right there. So you have to line up that gear with the gear on the camshaft. So that will put this engine in time. And let's see if we can spin it around, I can show you. 
right there. Johnny O'Connor bought an automobile. He took his sweetheart for a ride one Sunday. Johnny was togged up in his best Sunday clothes. She nestled close to his side. Things went just dandy till he got down the road. Then something happened to the old machinery. That engine got his goat. Off went his hat and coat. Everything needed repair. He'd have to get under, get out and get under to fix his little machine. He was just dying to cuddle his queen. But every minute when he'd begin it, he'd have to get under, get out and get under. Then he'd get back at the wheel. A dozen times they'd start to hug and kiss and then the darn old engine. It would miss and then he'd have to get under, get out and get under and fix up his automobile. Millionaire Wilson said to Johnny one day, your little sweetheart don't appreciate you. I have a daughter who is hungry for love. She likes to ride every day. Johnny had visions of a million in gold. He took her riding in his little auto. But every time that he went to say marry me, it was the old story again. He'd have to get under, get out and get under, to fix his little machine. Okay, so here we have the transmission installed on the engine. So I set this up on here to check the magneto gap. So this is the magneto section of it right here, and this is what supplies spark to the engine. You can run the engine off of battery power, but it's not as good. This provides about 32 volts when the motor is at peak RPM. So that's a lot more than the little 6 or 7 volts your battery is going to be putting out. And it'll give you a lot hotter spark if you run it off of this. If this goes bad, you can run it off of the battery just fine. It just doesn't run as well. And it'd be good to have this working. So I'm going to work on it a bit and see if I can, can get the gap set right. So the gap is what's the, the airspace between the magnet and the coil. So the coil is mounted to this plate, which is mounted on the block. And then the magnets are mounted on the flywheel. So the flywheel turns with the motor. And that moves the magnets on top of the coils, induces current in the coils, which is then picked up by a contact on the top, which is actually upside down here. There's a contact there uh, that will has an electrical connection that goes to your coil box. So this provides spark for your coils, but the gaps has to be set right or it won't induce current. So there has to be between 30 and 40 thousandths gap between the magnet and the coil. So I've been ha measuring it with my feeler gauges and I'm getting about 60 thousandths gap up here about uh, 50 down here and it's a bit tighter on the other side the other side's pretty close so i just got to go around measure it figure out where i need to add shims on this backing plate because there's a couple bolts i think there's four two on the top and then two kind of down in the middle so i gotta figure out how to add shims to tilt this the right way and bring those gaps close hopefully i can get it on the first try probably not so i gotta measure these gaps decide how many shims i need put those in and then put the transmission back on. And as you can imagine, this transmission's pretty heavy. It's really dense in here with all the gears, even though it's not real big. It's, it's pretty heavy. So uh, I put it on here with help of a, a, a helper. And I don't have a helper right now, so I'm going to see if I can get it on myself. It's, it's pretty tricky without the proper tools. They do have a, a gap-setting machine. It's like $200 to buy. If you're doing this more than one time, it'd probably be worth it. But it's a special uh, machine that you can set on the block with the a plate there and it'll, it'll say where the magnets are and you can adjust the shims without having to take on and off this transmission a bunch of times. You only have to put it on once. So if you're doing it very often at all, the gap setting tool is a huge benefit, but I don't have one, so I'm going to be doing it the, the uh, rough way. So I'm going to have to take this back off and put the shims in 
I have a bunch of shims. Where did I set them? Right here. So that's what they look like. They're just little pieces of laminated brass. It's 32 thousandths thick. And then there are two thousandths inch uh, laminations on it. So the easiest way to take the laminations off is to just hit it with a propane torch real quickly. And with, with a pair of pliers, then another pair of pliers, it'll start to peel and you can just peel one layer off at a time. Because they're basically soldered on. There's some type of solder material that holds these little brass flakes together. So if you just hit it with the torch real quick, it softens up that solder, they kind of start to peel. So I'm going to have to peel these down to what sizes I think it'll need for the first try and put it back on and see how it goes from there. Well, I got the Magneto gap set without too much hassle. I did have to do it a few more times. I wasn't able to do it right the first time, but I was able to get it set. Most of them are actually set to 25 thousandths, which is exactly what the manual says they should be at. So it is really close and I think it will work. So I was able to get those set and tidied up and now the engine is ready to be put in the car. So for the next video, I will be showing you my process of how I chose to put the engine back in the car. If you like this video, please subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment if you have any questions or concerns and I will try to get back to you. Thanks for watching.